Thank you, Kathy, for the very kind introduction. It's good to be back. I, I just realized that this is now my fourth visit, third presentation. So tell me if you've seen me speak on this topic before. Show of hands. Okay. Uh, there will be some review tonight. If you take a nap or I see you on your phone, you're fine. Okay, hard feelings. Uh, but there are some new things to talk about as well. And most sounds like most of you are here for the first time. Um, who's a 10th grade family? Most of us. Okay. Ninth grade families? 11th grade. Okay, good. All right, uh, it's good to be here. I'm going to add my thanks that you decided to attend tonight. And I know this topic, maybe you saw this, this event on your calendar, maybe it was more of a, I guess we should go, rather than I can't wait to, to hear this, okay? Um, what I have to share tonight, you may actually find interesting. It's very, it's quite possible that you will. I, I, can, I do think you will find it useful. You'll leave here this evening feeling like the, this part of the college process, the testing piece, uh, good understanding of exactly how to navigate it and not make the mistakes that are unfortunate and how to really do it to do it right, okay? Um, I am mainly going to be speaking to you from the background of someone who's worked with these tests now for a long, long time, okay? uh, 24 years ago, I'm dating myself, I was a freshman in college at USC, and I was on the basketball team, but as a walk-on, if you know what that means. Uh, it technically means no scholarship money for, for your sport, and also that I never hardly ever got to play. I spent most of the games doing what you're doing right now, okay? having a seat. Uh, I, 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 my part-time job, uh, starting freshman year was uh, tutoring students for the SAT and the ACT. And nobody goes to college thinking that what helped get them into college, the tests, will become their life work. Uh, so that's what's happened to me, and uh, this, is, this is what I'm doing. Uh, I've got some very strong convictions about the best ways to handle this. There's lots of different ways you might go about it, but there are kind of cardinal rules uh, to follow and major mistakes to try to avoid, and this is what we'll, we'll uh, cover this evening. Most of what I have to say is, is coming from that experience, working very hands-on with these tests for a long, long time. Uh, parents, you've heard me speak before, you know it. at some points it sounds like I'm dispensing parenting advice. Okay? That's a little bit cheeky for me to do because while I do have four children, my oldest is only in eighth grade, so what do I know? Okay? Uh, but the process that you're trying to go through as a parent, you know, what is it you're really trying to do with, with all of this? Uh, really help your son or daughter be successful, help them realize you know, uh, whatever opportunities are available to them. And with the tests, you, you don't want to make tactical errors that hold them back from doing as well as they can do. Just want to kind of do this right. right? This, this talk will help help you uh, do that. Um, hopefully everybody in your family received a copy of this real burly handout. Okay? The environmentalists in the room, I apologize, this is a bit much. Okay, but what we try to do with this 90-page book, any question that you have or may have in the future about testing, the answer should be here. Uh, the really well-researched explanation, a lot of data, it's all here. And tonight, I won't try to go and cover everything in here. I'll, I'll some, some cases point you to other resources. And I'm going to cover the issues that I think create the most confusion or sort of the trickiest to uh, uh, understand. There's also a companion app that goes with the book. Okay? Uh, so this talk, normally you're asked to put your phones away. If you have your phone out because you're downloading the app, there's some supplemental tools I'll explain as we go that uh, are really kind of rapidly evolving and timely, and those are best uh, covered there. Okay? Let's actually start with, with just some perspective and maybe you'll find it funny uh, uh, humor. I, anything I read, any, any cartoons I find that are poking fun at these tests or obsession with the test, I always clip those. A few of my favorites. This one is a classic. Okay? Uh, test scores on a tombstone. We'll never, never actually actually see that. Okay? It's meant to be a joke. Okay? Um, this one is really poignant, I think. So if it's hard to see from the back, the idea is there's an upset student. And there's a parent trying to kind of kill two birds who says, tell me what's bothering you. Use your SAT words while you do. Okay. <laughs> Students in that moment, would that be helpful? Probably not. Okay. I think what this reveals a couple things. Um, as parents, without exception, we are well-intentioned. Trying to do the right things and be helpful and contribute to the process and, and so forth. And sometimes we're ham-fisted awkward about it. But students, you know, give your parents the benefit of the doubt when they're trying to be productively involved and, and, and give uh, uh, good advice. Parents, this talk really will help you kind of know what are the key decisions, the milestones, where your role and input is especially important. And part of what this talk does as well is it sort of elevates everyone's understanding of these concepts and how the tests work, what they do, so that as you move forward in the college counseling program, and you have these conversations with, with, with Ms. Bank or, or others, uh, your, your understanding is elevated and it's, it's, a, it's a crisp conversation. Okay? So, um, I, I'm often asked to comment on just the state of the competition in 2018. What's going on and how, how competitive are things, what, what's happening. I think this, this is a, an interesting way to look at it. Uh, New York Times article titled High School Seniors Agony. So note the editor's word choice of agony. That was a conscious choice by an individual with an agenda 
to say agony, sort of play into the stress and anxiety around all of this. And tell me if some of these sentiments sound familiar. This idea uh, that competition for admission creates intense worry, and that it's never been so competitive, and that what used to feel like a good, strong application now no, no longer feels as competitive. These are, these are sentiments you'll encounter in lots of things you'll read about college admissions and so forth. This particular article was written in 1957, okay? long, long ago, right? when maybe your grandparents were going through the process. So some of this is it's the same as it always was. This has always been a rite of passage that pulls in a certain amount of anxiety and it's always felt like you're competing. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. And I, I would try to really resist things that you read or consume that kind of are playing into this agenda. Uh, back then that sold newspapers, now it gets clicks. The Times trots out a version of this piece every single fall. Okay? Uh, so without being becoming totally cynical and jaded, uh, realize that anything that, that you're reading, there's an agenda behind it, and you want to be, be thoughtful about that. Okay? Um, so I think it's a useless generalization to just kind of wring your hands about how competitive it's become. It's always been competitive, and uh, that's, that, that's part of the process. It is, I think, fair to look at what's happening right now in testing and say, this is a lot more complex than it used to be. Okay? Parents, I would wager that your experience with testing, if it was like mine, um, you probably didn't, when you were in 11th grade or 10th grade, go through a careful process like this to really carefully figure out SAT versus ACT. You maybe, had, maybe were not aware of an alternative. You probably took the test that was most popular in the part of the country where you grew up. Okay? Princeton, New Jersey, that would have been the SAT historically. Okay? Times and times have changed. Um, now those are the kinds of questions that we really think through very carefully and want to try to get right. And what's happened is colleges have really diversified their testing policies and practices. And I think in some ways they, they are, are using it as one of many ways to sort of demonstrate their values, kind of stake a position. So you have colleges all over the map with what they require, what they recommend, whether they allow you to hold back scores, whether they super score, all these questions. You're going to find tonight there's at least a half dozen topics on which there's a list of who does what, who requires what. Uh, the book has these lists, I'll highlight them. Uh, the app um, uh, will always have the most current list. Okay? We print this book twice a year. Okay? Um, here are some of the questions that students face that weren't always in the mix you know, years ago. Some are just very practical. And the first one is the big one. This is why the school goes to the effort, or has you go to the effort of taking practice tests. That first question, which test, SAT or ACT, uh, is, a, is an important one that you want to get right, ideally the first time. Okay? The best way to get it right is to carefully take a diagnostic test for each and then evaluate the results. We're going to do that this evening. Okay? So I'm the one, students, uh, if, if you're a little upset about kind of going through all that practice testing, uh, you know, uh, there's many schools that, that do that, and I, th and I think uh, Hunt is actually being very progressive and thoughtful in, in, in institutionalizing that. I want to also add an apology. Any students here who had to do a, 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 a makeup? Okay. FedEx, first time this has happened in forever, lost a package. So some students, and you should feel bad for them, one of their practice tests, the answer sheets were lost and they had to do a, refund, they had to do a makeup test. Brutal. Okay. The good news, as you pointed out, was hey, one of the big reasons to take these tests is to practice um, and you got, some, you got some extra, so you got a bonus. All right. Other questions. Uh, uh, do you need the essay? What to make of the subject tests? Okay? Uh, what to make of the PSAT? And then there are tactical questions. And the big one we'll talk about tonight at length uh, would, would be timing. Pros and cons of different schedules for doing this. And I will tell you, the most common mistake broadly that we are seeing you know, in 2018 are uh, students who are asked to start too soon and then do too much testing and test prep for too long. Okay? I want to make an argument this evening that, that smart prep is efficient. It's surgical. It's not a sledgehammer to a nail approach that you do for 18 to 24 months. It's something you do in a very smart way at the most developmentally appropriate time in your schedule and when you're scheduled with all your activities can uh, most easily bear it. And you try to really do it in a, a crisp way. Okay? I'm going to elaborate on that, uh, but uh, uh, part of your goal should, should be how can we help the student, speaking to parents now, get the, the improvement that's there to be had, but how can we also do that with as little attention, little extra time given to it as possible. Okay? When you see overall kind of crazy forms of, of, of test prep, uh, those students are not necessarily getting the best outcomes. Okay? I don't mean to rain at anyone's parade, but if you're already intensely involved in testing and test prep in 10th grade, I think you've jumped the gun. Okay? You're doing more than you have to. Okay? I'm going to try to support that, that argument. We'll, we'll cover these uh, questions as we go. 
Okay, this is uh, what the app looks like. So we're going to be tying a few parts of it, so feel free to grab it in the App Store um, or on Android. It's just uh, uh, Compass Prep. And at the timeline, the interactive tool to compare scores uh, and a way to schedule other practice tests. So there's some highlights that we'll uh, briefly discuss. Another silly cartoon, it's about the big topic of tonight. Okay, so this is the rumor mill in action. Parents kind of gossiping. Am I blocking anyone's view of the screen? No, okay. Um, so beware of a parent who thinks they've cracked the code and is like, giving out lots of advice based on their own kid's experience, okay? Might be interesting, might be relevant, take it all with a grain of salt. Uh, but uh, this, of course, is silly. But this is actually not the nuttiest advice I've ever heard on the question of which test to take. I've heard even, even worse, okay? Um, also, sometimes I, I would be very careful uh, about uh, getting testing advice from independent consultants, okay? Uh, working with an independent private counselor. You have in-house expertise. Uh, that should be where the buck stops. And they really know what they're talking about. Um, so. Um, this is not one of the considerations. Let, let me just, just frame this a few ways. Uh, parents, rest assured, uh, both tests, SAT, ACT, are equally regarded by colleges. The very, very last college where we could find even a whiff of a preference uh, was, uh, uh, funnily enough, Princeton University. This was more than a decade ago. You could still find subtle married language on their website that hinted at a, a, a preference, or really it was more of a comfort level with the SAT simply because they historically had more submitters of the SAT. Okay? When that was brought to their attention, again, this was a decade ago, they quickly removed it and had clear language that they have no preference. Okay? So it's your choice which test to take. Second thing, any generalizations you've heard of stereotypes about how uh, one test or the other is better for a certain type of learner, or one test uh, being quote unquote easier, none of that holds any water. Okay? We'll talk about what you should consider, but uh, there are no simplifications, generalizations that are, are, are useful, and you really want to make the choice that's best for you. Some perspective for parents who are less familiar with one test or the other. Historically, the SAT was more popular nationally and wildly more popular on the East and West Coast. So our clients, who uh, predominantly are on the East and West Coast, here uh, about a dozen years ago, back in the mid-2000s, I used to go to schools and I'd have to start from scratch to explain that the ACT was an option. People had never heard of it. And SAT used to be wildly more popular. That, over the years, was converging. And in 2016, ACT caught the SAT in popularity in our practice. Anybody have a freshman or sophomore in college? Okay. Do you fondly remember uh, being the guinea pig class for the brand new SAT about two or three years ago? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, being, I'm kidding. No, no one was fond of it. Uh, short version, College Board uh, was passed in popularity nationally by the ACT in 2010. Their response to that was to radically overhaul the test, uh, uh, and the scope of the overhaul and the time frame was incredibly aggressive. It was also done to have a product that could compete with uh, states and public school districts to offer a test that would not only college admission, but also serve sort of common core related needs. Okay? Uh, and boy, was it chaotic there for a while with a test that was half-baked, delays, um, problems with, with scoring. Uh, that's now all over. But for, for one testing season there, overwhelmingly, our clients, who tend to go to schools like this, are pretty sophisticated about how they think about this, they said no thanks to the SAT. The ACT had a huge year a couple of years ago. Okay? Here's one, one takeaway, though. Some of that was an overreaction. There were kids represented here who, who chose the ACT when they actually should not have. Okay? Despite the problems and issues with the new test, they had such clear, compelling uh, practice test data, you know, reasons to take the SAT that it was what they should have done. But they just, they just didn't. They followed the herd. They wanted to take the test their friends were taking. They had too much fear of the unfamiliar. And that wasn't a good choice either. So the, the point is that your testing plan is yours. Okay? And what your friends are doing, might be interesting to know about, but really it doesn't, doesn't affect what you should do. So that was an overreaction, and now it's leveling back off. And with our current 11th graders, we have seen it return to this natural equilibrium of about 50-50, which is what it rationally should be. If everybody tonight who took a practice test for both tests looks at what they have and responds to it rationally, uh, we're going to talk about how uh, you should typically see about a 50-50 split, kids who prefer the SAT versus those who prefer the ACT. Okay? Here at a high level, what you have with these tests, bless you. Okay. Parents, um, you would not recognize today's SAT. If you took the version back, you know, 80s and 90s uh, uh, when I took it, uh, you remember antonyms? Pair of vocab words, 
okay? Fairly obscure words, um, uh, analogies, okay? Back then, studying a big stack of flashcards would improve your verbal score significantly. Okay? That was a big, big part of the test. That has been uh, really diminished in importance. And basically, uh, what happened was the College Board took a hard look at the Common Core and at what the ACT was doing well and getting credit for, and that's what you see in today's SAT. Okay? Uh, it's, the narrative is that it's back to the basics, the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Okay? Uh, the, the false narrative was that, well, College Board just copied the ACT, so now the tests are so similar that it doesn't matter. Okay? That's not correct. When you kind of peel back the onion, there are some key differences that affect which one you may choose. Okay? So students, as we get into this, really pay attention and think about your own experience taking these and see what resonates with you as, as important factors in your uh, choice. So, for example, both tests have reading comprehension. The ability to read something that's pretty intense and dense, maybe not interesting, read it quickly, answer finicky questions about it, and do this under the pressure of time with, with a lot of high stakes attached to it. That is something that is on both tests. Okay? If, if reading comprehension generally is, is tough for you, uh, that's going to be tough on, on either test. Here are some of the differences. SAT, reading kicks off the test. 8 o'clock in the morning, your first section is 65 minutes of reading comprehension. Long section, maybe you're not, not awake yet. Okay? The good news is the time allotted is a little more generous than the ACT. The number of seconds per question you get a little higher on the SAT. ACT, reading comes up two hours into the test, so maybe now you're awake or, or now you're getting tired. Okay? Um, and it's much shorter, 35 minutes uh, reading on the ACT. That is a significant difference. You do not have to stay engaged for as long with no break on the ACT reading. The trade-off is it's faster paced, less than a minute per question on the ACT reading. It's really unforgiving. If you kind of get off your stride, you know, get stuck on a problem or two for too long, or a passage really doesn't connect with you, uh, your, your timing can get uh, messed up. So sort of a lot of this is going to come down to a pick your poison situation. Okay? Um, and that's a little bit of what the, what the reading uh, uh, confronts you with. Math, ACT math, very, very straightforward. 60 minutes, 60 questions, all multiple choice, use a calculator. Okay? Calculator is, is allowed. Okay? It's fast paced though, that, that's a brisk test. And it's just like the reading where uh, uh, if, if, if you kind of um, get off your game, slow down a little bit, it's hard to uh, recover. SAT math gives you more time per question. So that's great, okay? However, there's more of it overall. On the SAT, uh, uh, math is more of the time that you spend and, and more of your score than the ACT. It's broken up over two sections, but that's, that's nice. But it's also the, the final hour and a half of the test. So if you get fatigued by a three to four hour exam and math's not a strength, you'll be doing math when you're, you're really getting tired. Okay? Um, other quirky things about it, uh, there's, a, there's a section that does not allow a calculator. Okay? Quick aside, if you're on Twitter, Okay? Uh, and uh, you want to pick up your spirits after you take an SAT or ACT, go online, uh, hashtag SAT or ACT. Kids are hilarious, sharing memes about the problems they, they, that they hated and, or the experiences that they had. And this one, I, I just saw a week or so ago, really cracked me up. Uh, this, this poor kid was, um, the, the joke is he's realizing there's a math section with a calculator not allowed. And he's trying to kind of, you know, remember how to do basic subtraction. <laughs> I, I, uh, this is a little weird uh, to, to, to say, but I, I take the, the sit for the test regularly as a student. A lot of people in test prep do that. Okay? I go to a school where I won't be recognized, sit and take the test and experience what students experience. I get through the test pretty quickly at this point, so I have time to look around the room. And his expression is just, I, I, I'm so familiar. Okay? Everybody in the room has one of two facial expressions. Okay? Um, one would be looking really okay. You know, focused, determined, like furrowed brow, concentrating, like you have a plan, you're following it. And that's one common expression. Um, the other one would be this guy, just kind of stunned. Like I had, I didn't know what this was going to be like, and, and so I'm not sure what to do, and just really dismay is, is the other expression. The biggest difference between one group of kids and the other is, is attention given to practice tests. I don't care what form of prep that they did, self-prep, private tutoring, a class, uh, whatever. But the students who take the practice test regimen seriously, huge payoff for that. Okay? We do private tutoring. Okay? You work with us, you'll get matched with a great tutor who you'll love, and the lessons you'll feel like you're learning a lot, it's great. You'll, you'll have some homework assignments that you, you know, an hour here or there you can do, no problem. If you don't take the practice tests, take them seriously, your score won't improve as much as it otherwise would. It's like, it's like the dress rehearsal. You don't want to go into opening night and just it. Okay? 
unless it's improper. Right? Um, so, and the thing about practice tests is there's really um, there's there's no re there's no reason why you should or, or won't do it other than just being willing to do it. Right? They're free. We provide them as a free service. Additional practice tests if you need them. You can bypass a tutor altogether and get them yourself from College Board or ACT. So this is a matter of being willing to uh, not commit to it. Most of our students would take, say they're being tutored for three or four months leading up to a test date, they would take a practice test about once a month. So take about three or four leading up to the real thing. The correlation between improvement and attention given to practice tests is nearly perfect. Right? Um, so just something to think about. Whatever form of prep you do, uh, anticipate that practice tests will be a rigorous part of it. And taking them as seriously as you'll take the real thing uh, has a big, big payoff. Right? So, all right, don't be that guy. All right. Um, so SAT math, those are, there, are the uh, uh, trade-offs. ACT has a section called science that a lot of students you know, struggle with at first or just don't like. Right? It's kind of a weird section in that it's, it's a misnomer. It's not science the way you think of your science classes here at school. There's only a little bit uh, here and there where remembering some facts from your bio or chem or physics class would directly help you. What it is is uh, intense technical reading. Okay? With the quantitative element, there usually will be uh, tables of data, charts and graphs you have to sift through. Um, but really it's not about regurgitating science facts, it's about reading something, uh, say about a scientific experiment with some data and interpreting it. Okay? That doesn't sound so bad, the problem is it's incredibly speedy. It's the most fast paced section of any standardized test you'll probably ever take, including grad school tests. Okay? It's completely typical, this is you don't feel bad, uh, for your first experience with ACT science to struggle with pacing and maybe not even finish, you have to really rush uh, to uh, finish it, okay? Don't decide against the ACT because of just one initial bad experience with science. Okay? You can kind of learn uh, uh, you know, the, sort of the, the skill that's involved in it, how, you can, how and where you can move on more quickly. But, end of the day, if you really don't like it and can't get over that, um, nothing quite like it on the SAT. Okay? So for many students, no science is plus one for the SAT. The two sections that have, oh, by the way, I just talked to a young man about this uh, uh, before the presentation. If, in, if you're looking at your report and the science is the lowest score, uh, look at, at how it compares to your reading, okay? If you have a reading score that's significantly higher than the science, look at that as good news in that with some practice, most students can bring their science up to be in line with reading. It is actually a lot of the same skills, just kind of used a bit differently. So something to uh, think about. Finally, um, these two sections, ACT English, SAT Writing and Language have the most in common. And they're also the most coachable, okay? If uh, Writing and Language or English, if, the, if that's your lowest score, that's good news. This can come up quickly. Um, those sections are testing a finite list of grammar rules. And they're pretty consistent in how they present those rules and how they try to hide them in, in, a, in a sentence, okay? Um, so a very manageable, coachable piece of the test that you can definitely uh, improve on. By the way, if, uh, if you want to know more about each section, um, in the, the book, kind of the middle part of it, detailed explanations of the content, kind of the approach to every single section. This book actually has a lot of what you could use as good basic prep material. Okay? So that's all there. Last but not least, each test has an optional essay bolted onto the end. Okay? Um, this is a tough one for me. This essay, here, here's the problem. Um, only about 10% of colleges nationally require it up the slide. Okay? On the left are the colleges that are both highly selective and that require the essay. That's it. Okay? Very few colleges out there selective and require the essay. On the right, this is a sampling of the far more common practice colleges that do not require it. So again, on the left, pretty complete list. That's it. On the right, just a sampling. And uh, in the app, or in the, uh, in the book, complete list of who requires it and who doesn't. There's been some movement on this. Uh, Harvard, three weeks ago, uh, decided they're not going to require it anymore. Okay? Uh, hopefully that'll be the tipping point. Other schools will, will, will uh, give it up as well. Uh, the, the challenge with all of this is you don't know until uh, uh, your college list is final whether you definitely need it. Okay? So you don't want to, you know, when you're testing 11th grade, your college list is not final. You don't want to realize, say, fall 12th grade, Let's say you decide to add Stanford to your list. Not that you should ever do that. I went to USC, so we're kind of petty you know, or grievances with, with, with Stanford. Uh, but you'd have to take the entire test again just to pick up the essay. Okay? It could be a real drag. So the safe bet for me is even though not a lot of schools require it, I would say I would suggest you include it. You've got it if you need it. At a school like this, you've been trained to write. 
you can, with little effort, you can figure out what you really should do with that essay. Uh, in the book are sample prompts, explanations of how it's scored, a little bit of practice with it, and you'd be fine. You'd post a score that didn't feel like, like a bad score. Okay? So the takeaway, include the essay to be safe. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how you choose. And the, the way to think about this would be, even two years ago, when the SAT was not popular, no one was, was taking it, the students who did decide to take it, what was their rationale? So what are the factors to consider looking at your scores? The first one is probably pretty obvious. If your practice test scores, there's a clear winner between the two. And I'll, I'll talk in a minute about how to compare them, or that's actually on, in the app as well. If the scores have a clear winner, then you go with that. You know, uh, that trumps everything else. Okay? Here's some, some data. Uh, it's, it's interesting. We, we, we see nationally thousands of students a year the following sort of split. Okay? Uh, about 60% of students who take the test uh, find that it's a wash. The way colleges will look at the scores would be essentially equivalent. So for them, uh, it's a judgment call. We're going to talk about how, how they make that. Of the remaining 40%, it's split evenly between students who are clearly stronger at ACT or clearly stronger at the SAT. Okay? And you're trying to uh, 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 tease that out. That was uh, perfectly represented in the Hunt School practice test data. Okay? Uh, just slightly less than 60% of you roughly equivalent scores. The remainder, uh, remainder split between the uh, two. Okay? So you can zone out for a few minutes if you have a clear winner based on your uh, scores. The next thing that you consider is um, um, which test structure and pacing felt more comfortable for you. So was there a test where you really felt uh, pressed for time, you're running out, out of time? Or was there a test where the structure, starting with more than an hour of reading, was really uncomfortable for you? Or having the test finish with not more than an hour and a half of math was really, really uh, tough. Okay? By the way, if you have accommodations uh, um, due to a learning difference and you get extended time, the SAT's reading section kicking off the test is one hour, 37 and a half minutes. Great. Okay? Uh, so your energy level, how, how the pacing worked for you is something to really think about. As I said, if you really can't stand ACT science, Okay, lean towards the SAT. This one, if you are uh, scoring so high that you're going to be in range for a National Merit Scholarship, uh, that's my finalist status, which is really tough to do in New Jersey, highest uh, cutoff in, in, in the country, um, then you would need the SAT eventually to confirm the PSAT score. So in that scenario, which is very rare, then you would, uh, taking the SAT would kill two birds. Uh, this one is, is increasingly relevant. Um, I don't recommend that look, the test dates be your first consideration, but if you're thinking about this, all else is roughly equal. It's kind of a toss-up. You don't really have a clear preference. Look at the dates and see if one set of options suits you better. There's been some change over this in the last uh, couple of years. The SAT, for the first time last summer, rolled out an August test date. Okay? That may sound like a huge bummer to be doing this in August. It was wildly popular. It was the second most popular test date in its debut year in our practice. The rationale is, is important. So why was an August test date uh, so appreciated? Okay? Uh, what it allowed students to do, rising 12th graders, prior to that, a lot of those 12th graders felt like, I really need to kind of be done by June of 11th grade. Okay? And, that, and then the next SAT is not until October. It's right up against early decision deadlines. And so students felt this pressure to uh, be done by the end of 11th grade. Um, that's not great, because what are you doing at the end of 11th grade? APs, maybe subject tests, finals. Okay? Now, uh, August test date lets students uh, fall back to that date comfortably, and it really worked out great for a lot of uh, students. Okay? ACT, not to be outdone, debuts a July test date this summer. Yay, okay? Um, it too, we can already tell, is gonna be very popular from generally the same rationale, okay? These are not test dates that uh, uh, students who just finished 11th grade should be taking. That, that would be unnecessarily early, but a year, a year and a half from now, those summer test dates really fill a nice uh, 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 niche. Okay. Uh, accommodations. Uh, this is something to be on top of. If, if you receive accommodations, uh, you think you need them, be ahead of the process to get those uh, uh, approved. There's a liaison here at school that helps with that. Um, SAT, as of, as of now, a little easier to get the accommodations approved. ACT, a little tougher. Sometimes there's an appeal process. Uh, I, this is not a, not a popular thing I'm about to say, but if you receive accommodations, ideally try to take your practice test with the same accommodations. We ask that of our, of our students. Okay? Kind of for obvious reasons, but also kind of a bummer, but um, uh, it really helps. 
And last but not least, this I include because, uh, not, I'm a, not because I'm a fan of it, because it's a very common mindset that I see that's unfortunate. And that is uh, the, the family that, that uh, feels like any question that arises, or any possible tactical move that they could make, they should explore it to the nth degree, and it's kind of analysis paralysis is what this looks like. So for students, what it amounts to would be a testing plan that's never settled, and there's always kind of some change to it or overthinking it. Those students often end up taking both the SAT and ACT multiple times, even prepping for both, which is excessive, not necessary. Okay, one or the other is all you need. These are students who get thrown into a subject test that's ill-advised at the 11th hour, things like that. Don't do that. Okay? This talk tonight and the practice test scores you have, you will be equipped now, really, to at least block out a good, solid outline of what your testing plan will be, which tests and, and what timeline you expect to, to be on. And then try to keep that fairly intact unless there's a good reason to make uh, uh, changes. Okay. Um, here's how you compare the scores. If you have the scores in front of you, here, here's a tool that uh, lets you uh, compare them. There's also a tool uh, in the app, which is actually going to be even more current as of this summer. But here's essentially how it works. So there's something called the concordance table that sits behind this. Okay? So what you do is, uh, let's say you have a practice uh, ACT of 23 and a practice SAT of 1200. You would go across and down and see where these scores intersect. And in this scenario, there's a clear winner. Okay. That student is stronger on the SAT as a starting point for whatever reason. So that's, that's almost sort of the test that she should go with. Okay. Case closed. Okay. Again, that scenario is less common than one like this. Say you had a starting score of 29 and uh, on ACT and an SAT of 1300. These scores would intersect right in this judgment call zone where it's a, where it's a, it's a, it's a tie as far as colleges would perceive it. So in this case, you then need to dig more deeply kind of evaluate all the things that we've been talking about and uh, use your instincts to help decide which test is better for you. Almost every student, even the ones who uh, the scores don't dictate a clear winner, when you have a conversation with them, we're happy to have these conversations, okay, and help you think through the pros and cons of each one. They're usually, uh, it, students come up with a clear preference, okay, Just, and it's not a you know, hey, you know, Dad, I, I like the ACT, but I love the SAT. You know, it's, it's a, that one was less of a bummer, okay? Uh, but that student now got to make an informed, kind of proactive decision. And that sort of rolls, rolls, uh, rolls forward, okay? So this is the exercise. Here is uh, what it looks like in the app, okay? And here's why this is important. Um, the data behind this is uh, derived from a sample study the College Board did two years ago. It was very thin. And uh, it's actually using an old concordance from more than a decade ago as well. I won't bore you the details, but it's a synthetic concordance because when they rolled out the new SAT, they did not yet have the data they needed to do a true concordance. Okay? They have it done now. They have a new concordance. It's going to be released as early as July, as late as August. Okay? So the, this may change a little bit, especially at the high end. Okay? Um, in the app, as soon as the new table is out, we'll update the app and you would have it. And this is basically how it works. So uh, at the top, if you have it open, you move a slider and you peg your score. And the meter below it shows what that means. Is there a clear winner or is it a judgment call? Okay? And then as you scroll, um, you'll get to more information about the, the tests, how to compare them. Uh, links to more uh, explanation of, of, along the lines of what I've, I've been discussing. And um, it's a great way to, you know, the next year and a half you're taking practice tests here and there, you have in your pocket a way to compare the uh, scores, okay? So feel free to grab that. Um, let, me just, let me just quickly take uh, one section of one of the tests and talk about what the scores say and don't say about students. So this is some of what you, what you pull out, what you extract from your score report. I'm going to take what is actually a pretty straightforward section and show you how it can get a bit, uh, a bit uh, confusing. So the math on the ACT, content-wise, is very simple. It covers a wide range of math going back to middle school, okay, stuff you may, may not have not had in a while. Doesn't cover any of it in tremendous depth. Okay? Surveys all this math. Unlike the SAT, ACT really cares about geometry. Okay? If that was a weakness for you, SAT has less of it. If you like the geometry, ACT has more of it. Okay? But that, that's the math. Content-wise, pretty straightforward. The pacing is where it gets weird. Okay, where students run into to trouble. Students often initially think, if I have a test that is 60 minutes and 60 questions, I'll spend one minute per question. Okay? Actually, that would be a really bad plan. 
Students, if you took on the practice test exactly one minute per math question on the ACT, that wasn't ideal. Okay? Because, as you probably noticed, um, how are the questions organized by difficulty? Are they going from easier to harder, harder to easier, random? What did you notice? I hear some whispering. Escalating difficulty. By design, those problems are placed so that the, the statistically easier ones uh, start, start out in the beginning and they're getting much, much harder statistically by the end. Okay? So students who realize that think, well, surely I need more time for the hardest questions. And you probably do, but pushing lots of your time uh, trying to hurry and save lots of time for the end of the test is a bad plan for most students. And here, here's why. So this is called a heat map. And what, it, what it's doing is looking at data from a study where we, we had uh, several thousand students who had taken the, the ACT for the first time as a practice test. Okay? So inexperienced test takers left to their own devices, what did they do? And the colors indicate difficulty and performance. And the questions, the 60 questions, are broken up into thirds. Dark green where on each of these 11 different tests, dark green were really easy questions almost everybody answered correctly. Okay? Uh, dark red, really hard questions everyone was getting wrong. And you see the progression generally from green to yellow to orange to red. That's exactly what you should expect on a test that's laid out that way. Okay? Keep in mind, every single problem you'll ever encounter on a test uh, was, was developed very, very carefully. They know exactly what the stats are for that test and what percentage of students you're going to get it right and wrong and that determines where it sits on the exam. Okay? I'll come back to that theme in a second. So the problem is, this is not as consistent as it should be. You're seeing too much yellow and orange and even red where it really shouldn't exist. Okay? So here's some data on that. Think of it this way. If you, if you talk about the idea of uh, the percentage of possible points that you're getting uh, uh, throughout the uh, test, here's the baseline. 20% of the possible points is the bare minimum you should be getting. Why? Because there's no penalty for a wrong answer, so you should never leave one blank. And there's five answer choices in every problem. So just randomness, you know, you should get 20% of the possible points, unless you're just a really bad guesser. So say you just bailed on the test, just guessed and took a nap, that'd be your starting point. A way to look at this is, if you are investing time in a problem above and beyond what you need to just guess, it should be because you expect to do better than guessing. If time going into a problem doesn't help you do better than guessing, then what are you doing? Okay, so keep that in mind, let's look at that some data. First, students in this, uh, this score range of 30 to 36, 36 is the perfect score, okay? Here is their performance across the 60 problems on the test, and you see that most, of, at the beginning, they're doing quite well. As a group, they're getting nearly 100% of the possible points, okay? And that, that continues to about two thirds of the test. Here's the problem, there's two observations here. Number one, even these really high scoring students aren't doing much better than random at the end of the test in the last handful of problems. Okay? These problems are so difficult by design. Uh, they're really there to, to kind of break up 36s and differentiate between you know, who's a 29, 30, who's a 35, 36. Okay? That means they're not there for most students. I'm going to speak plainly in the next five minutes. Okay? I'm most helpful to you if I'm just really kind of blunt, kind of honest. Okay? There, this is not a test designed to be finished by most students. These problems at the end, uh, if your goal is to break 30, okay, great score, okay, you don't need to worry about these, okay, but there's some ego attached to these sometimes, and sometimes students, they know those really hard problems are coming, they want to have a good shot at them, they're hurrying, and it's time is not well spent because here's the hard truth, even really strong students, the last few problems, even if they had hoarded lots of extra time for them, their odds still aren't great. So the point is, why spend that time there when there's all these problems back here that you are supposed to get right and frankly you have no business getting wrong. A student who can break 30 on the ACT should never miss a problem in the first 40 questions or so. It's never a good reason. You were hurrying and made a, a kind of a careless mistake, um, you misread it, you know, you correctly answered the wrong question, they missed a piece of information. That's the low-hanging fruit that with real strict focus on knowing what you're doing, and letting those problems have the time that they need, you can get all of those right. So here's the low-hanging fruit. And if you're talking about trying to build up a, a score increase, let's say you're starting at a 28, and you'd love to get well into the 30s, okay? Kind of the base of your score is going to be perfection where you should be perfect, okay? You achieve that, and then you, and then you, you start to build speed back up without sacrificing accuracy, then you get your score even higher. 
but you just don't kind of just swing for the fences on problems where odds won't be good no matter what. Okay? Does that make some sense? Um, let's just take students in this range, 23 to 29. Here is their performance. A couple quick observations. These students are spinning their wheels in the last half dozen questions. Time invested here is, is break even versus guessing. Okay? These students, too, if you can get a 25 on the ACT, the first 35 or 40 questions should be in your wheelhouse. Okay? First 30 questions, you shouldn't be missing anything. If you are, and you can see students definitely are, that is, is where you kind of start building your score up first. Okay? And you might just have to kind of accept that the best way to take the test is to uh, save only enough time for the last five to 10 questions to just guess. You can guess randomly the last 10 questions and still move your score uh, uh, up significantly. Okay? Last but not least, students in the 16 to 22 range, this is just really, I think, uh, unfortunate if they don't get good advice that's an easy fix. Okay? These students all the time spent in the last third of the test is not helpful. Okay? Um, and not only is it wasted time, think about the experience of taking a high stakes test. You know, you can feel it. If you're getting one question after another wrong, that's a huge bummer. Okay? Um, it's demoralizing. You'll take that you know, uh, to the next section, and it's not necessary. The good news is a student with, a, with an 18 or a 20, the first 25 to 30 questions by design should feel mostly manageable. Okay? Time spent there should pay off. So you could have a student with this profile this trend, take the test again tomorrow and radically change how uh, she spends her time. You could say spend 59 minutes on the first 40 questions. Slow way down. That will feel a lot better. Okay? And it's still uh, going to stretch you a little bit. Okay? For the last 20 questions, save one minute and just guess. Pick your favorite. Okay? It might sound a little bit glib, but I'm really being sincere. That would immediately help the student tremendously. Uh, so the point is, is Test management, knowing how to take the test, just pacing, is a big, big factor. Okay? This also, this is stuff that, on the one, it's not rocket science. It doesn't take months of tutoring to learn these basic ideas. You could read about it in this book. There's a heat map for every section of the test, an explanation in the book, um, and immediately do better. But left to your own devices, a novice test taker, this is often kind of a mess at, at first. So for all kinds of reasons, do not... Uh, Feel bad or panic if these practice test scores that you took in you know, spring of 10th grade are less than you'd hoped for. Okay? These were literally the practice for the later practice tests. Okay? Just a starting point, and things uh, uh, can move around a lot. Okay? So just some thoughts on how uh, the test structure works. So kind of the question is, begs, well, so what's a score say about a student? How do you improve it? What does it mean? Um, the, the College Board and ACT would like to claim that the bulk of their test is an instrument, instrument measuring content knowledge. What do you know, period. Okay? That is only part of it. Okay? There, you have to take two students who have the same knowledge of the, the, the facts, but one is, knows how to take the test and one doesn't, and there's a big discrepancy in scores. Okay? Um, test prep companies and tutors like to act like it's all about the tricks. Okay? And we show you these, these clever strategies, and just off you go, your score skyrockets, and we've got the best tricks, and all of that is, is hype too. Okay? Yes, there are definitely strategies and methods that are, are very helpful. And there is an approach, a method for every single type of problem you like, you'll see that definitely uh, helps. Okay? But a couple, a couple things. The, the, the library of, test, of testing strategies is pretty well understood. You know, uh, that's not a differentiator really for tutors or, or for companies or even for, for books. Okay? Everybody teaches some version of kind of the same body of, of, of techniques. It's about how well you learn them. How well suited they are for your score level and your strengths. Do you know which one to use when and how to use it quickly and accurately every time? You know, th these are the things that, that uh, come with practice. So just know that, that uh, uh, quality test prep and seeking really meaningful improvement, there aren't a lot of shortcuts. Okay? Uh, and it will be like anything else you're trying to learn and, and improve at, it's going to be some work. Okay? So for parents, it's really critical to help the student figure out a form and a structure of test prep or tutoring that uh, is, is as just ideal for her as possible, and then is, is dropped into the student's schedule at the least worst time, okay? as if there's ever a great time. Okay? Students uh, in 11th grade, raise your hands. Uh, do you expect to have lots and lots of extra time and motivation for test prep? Okay? No. Okay? So uh, parents, what you're trying to do as a family is, is really figure out uh, the, the, the ideal way to, uh, to do that. I just talked about optimal time management. 
It's a big piece that's often overlooked. I like to say that every student should, should by the time they're, they're, they're taking it for real, they should be taking it perfectly. It doesn't mean a perfect score necessarily, but it means that for them, every moment spent was, was perfectly invested. They're always doing the right thing at the right time in terms of their uh, uh, approach. And some of this also is getting over some emotional issues and some mental discipline. Right? Uh, there are students out there who on this practice test, here's something that, that, that they did. They got to a problem, tough problem, and with a quick bit of effort, let's say 20 seconds, they figured out this has to be either A or B. Got it down to A or B, and that's, that's good, meaningful uh, process of elimination. They, they felt frustrated, and they sat there and kind of stared at it, obsessed over it for another 90 seconds, before finally admitting to themselves, I can't go any further in a guest A or B. Okay? That time is precious. That maybe was good for two other problems. Okay? So the other thing that you call it as, as, a, as a student is this really perfect sense for you of when to cut your losses, exactly how much time to invest in where is, is optimal. These are things that come with practice. Another just issue emotionally is anxiety. That is totally understandable that a test like this provokes a certain amount of, uh, of stress. And I don't have a silver bullet for that, but what I will say is that the students have a broken record who give enough attention to practice tests, that's when anxiety starts to really become manageable. Why? Because you're completely familiar with what's going to happen. You know exactly what to expect. You have seen your practice test score steadily rising. You know what you're going to do. And that's, it's that familiarization that can help uh, keep anxiety in check. So what test prep tutoring is trying to do is take you and your scores and your schedule and your strengths and you know, who you would work best with, and then working on these different areas and different measures depending on what, what you need. Okay? This, is, this is what's kind of going on behind the scenes. I thought I'd wake you up here with an actual problem. Okay? So, parents, I apologize if you didn't know you're going to be asked to do geometry tonight. Okay? Bear with me. But I want you to just kind of get a sense of what students experience and also kind of what's going on with, with the test. What does it say? So, I'll bring some water while you take a look at this real quick. Okay, time's up. I'm being a little bit silly, but honestly, this is part of the student's experience. It's always feeling like you're, you're rushing, you're not on the clock, okay? Um, this is an interesting question. Let me ask you this, this first, okay? I know some of you aren't listening to me, and that's fine, okay? Um, imagine, this may not be a stretch, okay? Imagine you're rusty on geometry, okay? And you're staring at this, and you feel the clock ticking, and there's somebody annoying next to you coughing, and the pressure of this is all operating on you. And really, you're, you honestly don't understand quite what's, what they're saying and where to start. Okay? Kind of overwhelmed by what's in front of you. If that were you, put yourself in those shoes. If that were you, what answer choice do you think might be appealing? Another way I can ask the question is, what do you think is the most popular wrong answer? E. E, okay? uh, e is the most popular wrong answer. Okay? And it's, it's actually a terrible guess, but it's, it's popular because it sort of lets you off the hook emotionally. Right? It's not that I can't do it. None of us can. Not enough information has been provided. Okay? Uh, that is, is wishful thinking. Okay? That will never be the right answer, uh, on a, especially on a harder problem. Okay? Speaking of difficulty, did anybody notice or think about where they were on the test? This is, this is number 50. You're near the end. Okay? So this is not supposed to seem simple, easy, quick. Whatever jumps out at you right away as a, as a good, obvious answer is almost certainly not right. Okay? So the first thing to do is cross out E. It's a sucker's bet. Bad guess. Okay? Then what you want to do is engage with the problem. Students, I'm going to call you out here for a second. Okay? If you get your, you look at your test booklet and you let your parents see it and there's no writing in it, it's pristine, that's not good. Okay? This is not one to try to do in your head. Okay? So the first thing to do is put pencil to paper, try to draw what's being described and follow the rules and just get a starting point. Engage with the problem. Most students, if they, if they try that, they'd probably uh, start with this. So two parallel lines and two lines not parallel, and how many points of intersection does that give you? Five, okay? This is a great start, okay? The savvy student, though, again, is kind of suspicious. There must be something more to it. Anybody see how four could work as an answer, okay? Now, four is not right. Four is, is wrong, but you shouldn't feel bad because it's the most popular wrong answer for the highest scoring students, okay? What's going on there? Why would a high scoring student be going for four? Imagine, you're bored with this. You're an honors pre-calc. You had geometry in eighth grade. You're flying through it. Okay? It's beneath you. And you're making a careless mistake here or there. Okay? There's one word in the problem that rules out four as a possible answer. You see that? See what that is? It's the word exactly. 
Okay? The only way to get four points of intersection would be to have two pairs of parallel lines forming a box. That breaks the rule. Okay? Think about just how the, the, what it's like to design test questions. Easy to write a problem that fits the specs and, of course, provide the correct answer. Test design, we labor for hours over building four wrong answers that perform as we need them to. So that answer choice is a 36 buster. It plucks away about 10% of the test takers. You know, it kind of gets them, all right? So the problem the stats are, are what uh, the ACT needs it to, to uh, be, okay? Uh, if you keep plugging away at it to try different things, uh, here's, that would still be five points of intersection, but that would give you three points of intersection. Right? That's a little subtle, not, maybe something not everybody would think of right away. And if you're taking a test, and on a hard problem, you, you put in some work, and you feel like, oh, I see what they were trying to kind of slip by students, then you're probably getting it right. If on a hard problem, your first instinct is, oh, this one's obvious, okay, they probably got it. Okay? So that, this is somewhat what's happening with these problems. Now, folks, I, the hard thing for me is I can't stand up here and really defend this as something that should be such kind of a gatekeeper in the college admissions world. You know, being able to jump through these hoops, you know, having such a role in where you go to college, I, I can't defend that. Okay? Some of this is just straight up gamesmanship, silly stuff. Okay? College board or ACT would say, well, it's, it's testing spatial reasoning skills you kind of have or don't have. It's testing whether you know some certain geometry concepts. Okay, fine, but it's not as straightforward as it could be. Okay, so this is some of what's happening uh, with, with the uh, uh, test. Okay, I want to just finish a few final topics and I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, uh, some questions. This is important to understand. This is the distribution of scores uh, on the ACT every time it's administered nationally. Okay? The SAT, if I showed you the distribution of those scores, the sh basic shape is very similar. What you're looking at is something close to a normal distribution. Are you familiar with, with the bell curve concept? Most students, most students by design, score within two standard deviations of the mean. It's just as a way to say they score in kind of this vast middle. That's where most students are scoring. So if I throw the percentile curve up here, um, here's the 50th percentile right around 2021. And notice the vast majority of student scores fall in that range. Now here's the thing. There's two important points to understand about this distribution. One is, is this. We could debate what a high test score says or doesn't say about a person. I would submit to you in the long haul of life, it doesn't actually mean a heck of a lot. Okay? And as adults, students, this is true. As adults, all of us can tell you about somebody we know, maybe was a great test taker, you know, uh, but has struggled in different ways because they don't have as much common sense or their work ethic is, is, isn't great or they lack interpersonal skill okay? or no sense of humor. Things that we know as adults in our relationships, in our lives, in our careers matter. Okay? None of that is captured by the test scores that you got back. Okay? That's an obvious point to well-adjusted adults. Easily forgotten if you're 16 in a competitive environment and these scores are flying at you. Okay? Um, so that's, let's, let's, let's accept that. What we cannot dispute about high test scores is that they are relatively rare. Only about 2-3% to of students um, score above the 750 on the SAT, and a very small fraction of the total testers score a 36 on the ACT. Okay? Uh, less than 4,000 students last year out of over 2 million got a 36. Okay? So it's a rare score. So the point for colleges is whatever value they choose to attach to these scores, you know, they're uh, distributed differently than, than grades. The distribution of grades from a 1.0 to a 4.0, the, the, the chart would look like this. Okay? A lot of 3.5s, 4.0s in the admission pool. Okay? So test scores provide for colleges this crude but marginally useful sort of sorting mechanism to give some context to grades. What does an A in pre-calc here, how does that compare to a, um, you know, a public uh, school in some other part of New Jersey? Okay? It helps give colleges some, some context. What I think is really helpful to know is what degree of improvement can you expect and what, what are reasonable goals? Okay, so let's look at a scenario. Say you started with a 19. Okay? Um, that puts you at the 44th percentile. And what that looks like visually is this. So you have, um, out of 100 students, here are the students that you're ahead of. Here's the field ahead of you. A realistic goal in most cases for most students would be to try to cut the field ahead of them in half. So that would mean um, improving to a 24 which would take you to the 73rd percentile, so what it looks like over here. That is two things, realistic, and I would say meaningful. You know, in the college admission process, as you're looking at a 
developing a list of schools where you'll be competitive, that would be very, very meaningful. Okay? And that is realistic. A five-point gain in the ACT composite doesn't happen easily, but it's, it's achievable for most students willing to do some, do some good work. Okay? Here's the hard truth. A 19 to a 34 would be virtually unheard of. And despite what you might see in some test prep marketing literature or, or, or something, that look at it in, in terms of, of percentiles. Going from the 44th uh, up to about the uh, uh, 95th, 96th. That's really, really tough. And the hard thing is, this might be the first test you've encountered where endless, you know, just tons and tons of effort uh, doesn't yield endless reward. Okay? Most students with test prep and effort given to this, they have a range of improvement that's there to be realized. But most students have a soft ceiling on their scores that's less than perfect. That is a reality for most students. Okay? So your objective is to say, what can we do? What are the best, smartest, most efficient things to do to realize the improvement that's there to be had? But when we start to butt up against that ceiling, that day will come, then what do we do? And here you have a choice. This is a, this is a parent uh, situation. Do you kind of face that reality and, and kind of accept it gracefully and say to your son or daughter, you know what, great job, you're done. You worked hard at this, you improved, awesome. Okay? Would you like to be done? You have other things you'd rather do? Good. Let's, let's call it a day with the testing. Or does the other side of your nature dominate and say, well, there might be another point or two out there. Let's take it one more, third or fourth time. A little bit more tutoring. You can do it. And I would submit to you that, that that's always at a cost. And even if it's not that the cost of it, whatever test prep, uh, it's, it's the cost of the student's time, which is precious at that point. You know, late 11th, early 12th grade, you've got a few other things going on. Okay? And also, what does it say to a student who's worked hard at it, seen a lot of improvement, oh, it's still not quite good enough. Okay? Um, so this is one of those, why you're here. You know, uh, questions like that will come, but the counselors can't give a black and white answer. It's sort of nuanced, it's gray, but that walk away, call it good point with test, will come somewhere between the end of 11th grade and early fall of 12th grade. And I'm trying to give you some context to uh, think about it. Here's another scenario. Um, say you started with the 29. That is the 91st percentile. A field ahead of you, not, not very many students. Cutting the field in half at this level would be mean only going to a 31. Not a big jump. Pretty achievable for most students. Uh, how meaningful is it? It's starting to become very marginally meaningful. Okay? Colleges who are splitting hairs between students who are, all, who are in the 30s are really, to me, kind of doing it wrong. Okay? Uh, these tests are not as precise as students often think they are. The standard difference, you know, psychometric term or, or concept, uh, is kind of like polling error. Like you shouldn't say your candidate is ahead of the polls if, you know, if they're inside polling error. Okay? It's sort of how standardized tests work as well. You cannot conclude anything meaningful uh, about a student's abilities when they're within a point or two on the ACT. Not, not built that way. On the SAT, it's about 80 to 100 points. You need to have a gap it's that large before statistically you should be concluding that there's a difference in abilities here. That's not though how you commonly think of scores being talked about. You, know, you hear about you know, uh, a 31 you know, being much better than a 29. It's, it's pretty marginal. Okay? So um, sure, you know, continue taking the test, retake the test when you're already this high if you have good reason to believe that a couple point improvement is there. Uh, but um, um, a lot of students, would, their time would be better spent elsewhere once they're into the uh, 30s. Okay? So this is some perspective on how, how uh, that improvement uh, plays out. Some good news. This is some data from a school in Los Angeles where we do uh, some consulting work for the faculty. And uh, we're looking at improvement from year to year. So this is an entire 10th grade class. And the blue dot is the student. That's where she scored in that year. This is the, the, uh, the score range. Here, then, uh, is where the same student scored the following year as an 11th grade. Okay, the red square is what that student uh, uh, moved to. So the trend that you see nearly across the board would be improvement, and in many cases, quite significant improvement. Okay? Now, this is a very competitive environment, private school. A lot of students do do some formal prep the summer before 11th grade. So that factor is baked in. Okay? Uh, but I would say that the even more significant factor would just be maturation, academic and otherwise. Okay? Um, so whatever you, you're starting with on these practice tests, again, truly just a starting point. You just don't let your dreams be dashed by a practice test taken in 10th uh, grade. Anybody spot this situation? You know, what happened there? Okay. I know what happened. It wasn't our client at the time, but we heard about it later. This is a, there's a moral of this story. This was a student whose parents started her with test prep in 9th grade. 
and did it intensely in 10th grade. And still, uh, summer before 11th grade, uh, she was put in kind of an all summer boot camp style uh, approach to test prep. It preempted some other things she thought she would do that summer. Those things were things that ironically would have had more value in the college admissions process. It was overdone. And by the time the PSAT in 11th grade rolled around, she's burned out, kind of butting heads with her parents over all of this, and just kind of goes in and tanks it. Okay? Now, I'm not condoning what she did. It's a waste of her own time, ultimately. But I get it. Okay? I have a 13-year-old daughter. I can imagine how this would come to pass, where you could be disagreeing and you know, combative about it. So that's not good. So I think the takeaway here is the student needs to be really driving this in terms of you know, what needs to be done, when are we going to do it, has to be on board with it. You know, really a situation where you know you can try to drag a horse to water, but it's not going to be a good uh, situation. So for what that's worth. Okay. Very quickly, if you're in National Merit range on the PSAT, more about National Merit in the, in the book. But basically, what um, here's how the formula works, and here's what's happening uh, in uh, uh, New Jersey. A perfect score overall is 1520 uh, on the PSAT. That's that's the new scale since the test changed. Um, and you can get weird scenarios. So you can have a scenario where two students have the exact same total score of, say, 1470. But the way the National Merit Formula works, the verbal is doubled in, in weight. So to calculate your National Merit Selection Index, you drop the zeros, double the verbal, and add it up. So this scenario, student A, same score as student B as far as colleges would view it, just made National Merit uh, in New Jersey last year, or this year. Student B missed it. Okay. And I've actually uh, seen this happen two years ago. It happened to a pair of twins. Okay. I have twins, so that was kind of harsh. Wow, it was, it was a huge, huge bummer. Okay. Um, but just know that if you're in range for national merit, that's great. Uh, uh, you get more bang for your buck with the verbal. And quite honestly, in New Jersey, you, you need two scores that are approaching perfect. Okay. A very, very tough pool uh, relative to a smaller population. Okay. So, well, All right. Last few topics, real, really quick ones. Subject tests. Okay. Um, subject tests, parents might remember these as achievement tests. That's what they were called when I took them in the early 90s. Okay. Uh, then they became SAT 2s, and now they're called subject tests. Hour-long tests in different academic disciplines. Okay. Um, not the same as APs, but kind of like mini APs. Okay. It's much more about what do you know in chemistry or US history. Math 2 is a lot of pre -cal. Okay. One hour. Do you need them is the big question. I'll get to that in one second. But if you need them or if you think they might be helpful and you want to take them, here are your choices. And generally, you're trying to pick the, the, the tests that correspond with your academic strengths, your most advanced classes. And here's the key. You're trying to take them at the optimal time, which is typically the end of the school year when you have the class that corresponds. Okay? Um, you will get more guidance on this uh, from the college counselors. Heed that advice to a T. And don't make the mistake of, of not taking them when you should. Even with a tutor, if you're trying to take the, the physics test, you know, six months after you finished uh, 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 physics, not a good situation. Okay? So here's your options. For the sake of time, I won't discuss them in depth, but in that the book, it's all near the back. Detailed FAQ, uh, talking about test selection, uh, when to take them, implications of repeating them. There's also in the book a description of each test, content, uh, what's on it, uh, what's happening with it. Okay? Do you need them is the question. Okay? And you may very well not. And lots of students just don't, don't need them. Here's some perspective. 10 years ago, parents who have older kids, 10 years ago, here were the 44 colleges that explicitly required them. You had to have them. Okay? Here, 10 years later, present day, only four colleges remain that still explicitly require subject tests. Only four. There were five when the Carnegie Mellon just dropped out recently. Okay? What's going on here? Well, these four, it's no coincidence that they're all renowned for what? They're engineering programs, okay? Um, so the math and science subject tests are, are helpful to them. Did these other 40 colleges become less interested in tests like these? Or easier to get into? No. Um, so what's happening here is this, I think, really thoughtful, progressive movement where colleges are trying to, to attract and be able to admit more underrepresented students, build more diverse student bodies. So they look at their requirements and say, here's something that is really uh, uh, kind of punishing for a student who doesn't go to school like this, it maybe lives two hours from the test center, and the cost of taking all these tests adds up. You know, uh, not getting great counseling is, is, is the big thing. So subject tests are an, an, an unnecessary requirement, kind of an impediment for the, uh, the diverse student body that they're trying to uh, reach. Okay? But you have to think about your own context. And if you go to a school like this one where they know you get great counseling, 
and they know you have the kind of a, a curricula that would set you up to take subject tests, and you're looking at really competitive schools, they're nice to have. Okay? And there still are a handful of colleges that require them. This, which is in the handout and available through the app, is probably the most useful context. About 80 colleges, where I think they still have some relevance. Okay? These are colleges where uh, subject test scores may be recommended, or the language is kind of a soft, will consider if submitted. But we still see uh, students in these applicant pools who have subject tests. So in, these, in this context, if you could take the test and do, and do well, um, then it would, be, it would be worthwhile to do so. Okay? Good news is you don't need as much prep or any prep for a subject test. By definition, if you're a good candidate, you take that one because you're really good at that material. Okay? So tutoring for subject tests involves practice tests, which you should at least do. Okay? And then tutoring will tend to be uh, similar to academic tutoring, or brushing up academic weaknesses. But here's some context and to get more uh, in the app. Last topic is the testing timeline. How to put this together on a calendar. Okay? And if you have the app, uh, this is one of the, actually I think the best features. What it does is based on a few questions you answer, it drops you into a timeline where you are. So we're right now in May of, of 10th grade. Okay? And it talks about what is relevant at that moment in time. And for each item, you can check off if you've done it. You've done the first one. Okay? Um, and if, if you haven't done it, there's a link to more information about it or the option to schedule a practice test. And uh, it kind of moves with you then uh, through the testing period up through fall of 12th grade. So you always have a way, to, what's going on right now in testing? What should I be thinking about? And then links to more resources to answer the uh, uh, questions. Okay, so feel free to grab that. Here's a summarized version of it that I'll, I'll quickly discuss. Okay? So first, kind of the scary news is from now, end of, end of 10th grade through the, the fall of 12th grade, here's all the tests you could take. Okay? My goodness, don't do that. Okay? Um, so let's simplify this. First, highly recommend that instead of taking all of these and starting too early, you really focus on the window when uh, it's most developmentally appropriate to be taking these tests. The vast majority of students post scores that represent peak scores that they then want to reveal to colleges, second half of 11th grade, and the first few months of 12th grade. That is the window, scoring zone, when you're most likely to do your best. Uh, the, the most unfortunate thing we see happening in the last 10 years or so with timing is, is more and more students than ever before, not only starting test prep much earlier, and doing a ton of it early, uh, but, but trying to take the test early in 11th grade. Okay? Very, very rarely does a student take the test early in 11th grade and post a score that she wants to use. It inevitably ends up being a practice test. Okay? And uh, unless your scores are sky high, your national merit level really, you're not going to post a score early in 11th grade that is one you want to reveal. It will effectively just be a practice test. The problem with taking a real test, an official test, as a practice test, is now you have one on your record. There's a few schools that still force you to reveal all your scores. Okay? Um, you also had to pay for it, 60 some dollars. You have to wait weeks to get your score back. And you have to wait months to get the test booklet back, or it's in, on many test dates, it's never available. Okay? So if you are still in, really realistically in the practice phase, taking the practice tests that are readily available. We use real released tests. Okay? So you're getting an accurate uh, score. That's better than sitting for the test efficiently fall below the grade. Okay? When does test prep fit into the mix? Depends on the student. The trend is, is more and more to, to start it in summer before 11th grade. I have mixed feelings about this. Okay? I understand the rationale. You're looking at maybe a very intense 11th grade year. You have more time over the summer. You want to get the ball rolling. Okay? So to me, it's all what goal do you attach to it? If the student is for no particular reason being pushed to prep really intensely over the summer because there's a goal of posting a test uh, a score beginning of the 11th grade, that in most cases is misguided. But if the rationale is let's kind of build a foundation, let's, let's uh, get going on this but not overdo it as kind of a ramp up, that makes perfect sense. Right? But just know that the first official sitting, usually spring 11th grade is the right time. Simplify it further by specializing. Don't take both tests repeatedly. Pick one or the other as we've been talking about. So let's say you chose the SAT. We're going to strip this down and show a simplified uh, version. Then I think it's helpful to think about what are the fixtures. So if you have APs, those are uh, going to be in May 11th grade right now. Uh, you uh, want to think about your final backstop. So maybe what you decide is uh, October 12th grade is the very latest I want to possibly be taking the test. So that's my, my sort of end date. And some other things that you may have on your schedule. So you've got the PSAT October of 11th. 
You might have a subject test in of 10th grade, that's pretty rare. You more likely have subject tests in of 11th. So these dates kind of set themselves. Right? Then you think, when will my first uh, sitting of the SAT be? For many students, March makes a lot of sense. And you notice you've still got plenty of opportunities, oops, to, uh, to retake the SAT. You have May or June, again, working around subject tests, August now, and October. So this is a, a plan that works. What I just described is the plan that makes the most sense for the most students. We kind of refer to it as traditional testing. This is elaborated on in the book. The only students who should be doing early testing, which I define as doing a lot of work somewhere in fall and trying really hard to be done by the end of 11th grade, really setting that as a, as a firm goal, are the students for whom it's realistic. Students whose starting scores are already fairly high. Okay? Um, so this plan is smart because it leaves open the possibility uh, your approach of falling back to um, those fall and 12th grade uh, test dates. This scenario of deferring it, I hardly ever see anymore. This is really unusual. This used to be the norm about 15, 20 years ago. Most students, believe it or not, waited to do most of their testing and prep the summer before 12th grade. Okay? Now I don't see a lot of that anymore. Here's the funny, not really funny thing. Okay? That worked. Especially worked well for boys. Sorry, fellas. You know, late bloomers, more time to kind of really be motivated and ready, ready to do this. Um, it can work out really well, but I don't see this happening uh, a lot anymore. Okay? Um, so many different ways to, to do a testing calendar, and these are some of the considerations you have to think about. If the answer of what test to take and how to do it, when to do it, were the same for everybody, I would be here. You know, counseling office would say, here's the to-do list, for all of you the same, off you go. And it really, uh, it, there are these decisions you want to try to get right. Some ways to reach us. Uh, the only thing that we charge for is one-on-one is -on -one private tutoring. Okay? Uh, if you find this helpful and you can stomach getting one more email a month, uh, please make sure that we have your email address. There's a card in the back of the book that you can fill out, or if you downloaded the app, you gave us your email address there. We'll send you one email a month summarizing what's been going on with testing. We are prolific writers in our blogs, happy to uh, can tell you. Um, practice tests are something that we're happy to provide on an ongoing basis. Our evaluation of them, a recommendation, something that we do, and then private tutoring is, is uh, available. So there are some ways uh, to reach us. And within the app, another feature, you can request a space in a proctored practice test. We're really simulating the environment, making it like the real thing. Schedule is always in the app. And my last comment here, I think, is to send you off with something really positive. If you think about the, the world of college admissions and selectivity, okay? um, the vast, vast majority of colleges, 80% of colleges, admit more than half of their applicants. Most students who apply are admitted, okay? Bless you. Only 1% of colleges, you can hardly see the purple slice here, admit less than 10% of their applicants, okay? Now that 1% is about a few dozen. If I named them, you'd have heard of them. They're great schools, okay? Uh, but there's a big world out there, and I'm not here to preach to you about fit. It's not my, my role. Uh, but uh, I can tell you from experience just observing this for a long time, okay? Uh, I don't know anybody individually here, but I can say what I'm about to say with confidence. There's far, far more colleges for every student here that they could apply to, be admitted, afford it, go and have a great experience, get a great education, be set up for the next phase of their life, career, grad school. There's way, way, way more of those colleges for every student than there are colleges that you think you'd like to attend but who won't take you. That's just the math. So if you start with that kind of frame, Take a deep breath. You know, what's left in front of you is still at times complex and intimidating, but it's also really interesting. And it's this process that has lots of good outcomes. There are many colleges out there that would be a home run for you, and you're just trying to make sure that you find at least one of them. Okay? Um, so with, with that in mind, like I, this data I think is really just helpful. The admit rate nationally is 70%. All applications overall and acceptance rate, 70% of the time the answer is yes. Okay? Yield is an interesting statistic. Yield is what you live and die by if you're an admissions officer. Yield is the percentage of students to whom you offer admission who say yes back to you. 33% okay? nationally is the yield rate. Okay? So two thirds of the time, students rejecting the college, saying thanks for admitting me, but no thanks. Okay? Uh, so you were in the catbird seat, but again, I'm kind of petty, I'll take a dig at Stanford. Stanford uh, uh, denied about 97% of their applicants. Okay? Um, and in their applicant pool, they had, oops, hundreds of students with perfect test scores. And they denied 70% of those students as well. Okay? So lest you think, no matter what I've said, it's only about the test scores and we're going to do whatever it takes to max this out, uh, that is, is not the activity that really holds the most value. 
in the admissions process. So do smart things <clears throat> to help test scores be what they can be. But a good mantra for all of this is, yes, we're going to do testing right, and, but we're going to try to not give the test and test prep one more second than it actually merits. Okay? If that's your mindset, you're asking the right questions, and you're going to be doing the right thing by your son or daughter. It's free advice from the parent of an eighth grader and some elementary school kids. Okay. This is my all-time favorite cartoon. I love this one. This poor guy is dismayed and fine, but that score still matter. Um, my view of all of you, you're laughing a bit more at this than you did at the tombstone slide an hour ago. So that's, that's progress. Okay. Um, I'll say this. I, I, uh, I will stick around for questions, those of you who have some. What I'd like to do is take questions from the audience. I'll repeat the question through the mic so you can hear others' questions. If you have had enough of testing for one evening, uh, please feel, feel free to go, so dismiss yourself quietly, but I'll stick around for uh, questions. Thank you for having me. I wish you all the best with this. Okay? Good luck to all, all the 10th graders at the end of the school year, and wish you well down the road. Thank you for having me.